Ladies and gentlemen, it's my honor to welcome all the area clergy from Brockton, Easton, and other towns. Before I start, I would like to welcome William Dickerson back to Temple Beth Amuna. Congratulations on the birth of your son, William III. We look forward to hearing you later this afternoon. Where have you gone, Joe DiMaggio? A nation turns its only eyes to you. To paraphrase Paul Simon, Dr. King, we need you now more than ever. 2017 was a year like no other that I have lived through. It was not the promised land that Dr. King saw from the mountaintop. The vision that we have been celebrating here at Temple Beth Amuna and at Messiah Baptist Church was not one of white supremacists, neo-Nazis, Ku Klux Klan, and other hate groups. I was never so proud as when the Boston Common Meeting for the call, for what I call, Make America Great Again, was halted by good people in the streets marching against the protest. A certain candidate in Alabama believed that going back to slavery and Jim Crow was when America was great. I call the election in Alabama the first step in making America, America again. Dr. King once said, and I lost it. <laughs> in August of 2017, in Charlottesville, 32-year-old paralegal named Heather Heyer was killed when a driver filled with hate drove his car into the marches. Heather Hyatt dedicated her life to standing up for those she felt were not being heard, her family and friends said. She died fighting for her beliefs and campaigning against hate. She died like many before her during the Civil Rights Movement. She was out there the same way a 32-year-old Martin Luther King was out there. Hell, she was out there the same way and now Martin Luther King pushing 90 would still be out there. This year we are dedicating our program to Heather and all the people who gave their lives in the movement. Good afternoon. It's my pleasure to welcome you to the 22nd celebration and observance honoring Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. This is just a break from the work that we've all been called to do. Uh, it's a celebration that reminds us that there is still work to be done. It is the pleasure of the Messiah Baptist Church to say that we have for the last 22 years been a partner in community and citizenship in terms of remembering the work of Dr. King and honoring him through the work that we do in our individual and our collective lives. Reverend Michael Wayne Walker and Reverend uh, Reverend, Rabbi, <laughs> same thing in my book, uh, <laughs> and Rabbi David Werb were uh, part of the original group that started the MLK Observance and Celebration. And on behalf of uh, Reverend Dr. Michael Wayne Walker, I'd like to share uh, just a little bit from him. It says, walk together, children. Don't you get weary. This is from the Negro spiritual. 22 years ago, I, Reverend Michael Wayne Walker, was pleased to join with the forward-thinking rabbi of Temple Beth Amuna, Rabbi David Werb, in an effort to make a difference in our community. How pleased I am that Messiah and Temple Beth Amuna, Beth Amuna are still working together for the betterment of Greater Brockton. Messiah and Temple Beth Amuna are good partners, good parishes, because good people love and support them. Rabbi Werb and I 
were covetous that Temple Beth Amuna and Messiah parishioners develop a deep and intellectually rigorous understanding of the Western religious traditions, that they learn to bridge cultural divides, and that in the spirit of Rabbi Abraham Joshua Heschel and Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., they cultivate the inner resources and framework of meaning necessary for effective activism. Dr. King speaks in 1967 to three evils of this day, militarism, materialism, and racism, in what would be the one of his last writings, which he entitled The World House. How happy I am today that two remarkable souls, the Reverend Gerald Riggins and Rabbi Gross will rekindle the vision of the World House with deep and enduring gratitude, the Reverend Dr. Michael Wayne Walker. We are here to celebrate and honor Dr. Martin Luther King. We have created for you what we think is an effective and inspirational program that will leave, give us all an impetus to leave here knowing that there is work that still must be done and that we are a part of the work, and that we will get it done together. Amen? Amen, Amen. Amen again. Amen. All right. To, st to start our program today, we'd like to welcome Minister George Davis from Mount Moriah Baptist Church. How is everybody? Amen. Amen. If y'all could do me a favor, if you don't mind, those of you who could stand, if you could stand and just stretch across the aisles, I want you to hold each other's hand. So what I want you to do right now is to close your eyes and just think of the greatness of the person of the hand that you're holding. I want you to think of the love of the hand that you're holding. I want you to think of God's power in the hand that you're holding. I want you to think of God's wisdom in the hand that you're holding. I want you to think of the awesomeness of God that he could bring together such great people to honor a person who wanted to see all people be able to be one with each other, to live with each other, to grow with each other, to nurture one another. Think of that God created us all that he put something in each one of us that would help us to grow, to help us to be strong, to help us to live a life that God would be pleased with. Father God, we thank you for all that you have done for each one of us. We thank you for your greatness. We thank you for your mercy. We thank you for your power. Father, we thank you for your forgiveness of sins. We thank you for drawing us closer to you. Father God, we thank you for the hands that we are holding. We thank you for the breath of life in each one of the hands that we are holding. We thank you for the limbs that work to get us to move to even be here with one another. Father, we thank you for knowing the numbers of hairs on our head. We thank you for the joining of hearts to be one with you. We thank you for the celebration of a life that has created an opportunity for us to be in the same space. Father God, continue to bless your people. Continue to strengthen your people. Continue to walk with your people. 
Continue to talk to your people. Help us to be in union as one with you, Lord. Father, for there is no one like you. There is no one like you. Nobody greater. Father, right now we thank you that we can't even see any barriers that are between us, whether it be financial, whether it be the color of our skin, whether it be the neighborhood we live in. But God, we thank you for hearts that are set on the love of people, the movement of people, the growth of people. May you be here, Lord, with us this day that we would hear clearly what you have called each and every one of us in this room to do, whether you're a child or a senior. Be with us, rest in our hearts. Amen. 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 We who believe in freedom cannot rest. We who believe in freedom cannot rest until it comes. I am going to do an a cappella selection from Sweet Honey and the Rock. The official name is called Ella Song in honor of Ella Baker. Um, and I ask you to join in with me when we get to the chorus, which are just those two lines I just mentioned. So if you feel your song coming on, this is the MLK Idol Opportunity. <laughs> we who believe in freedom cannot rest. We who believe in freedom cannot rest until it comes. We who believe in freedom cannot rest. We who believe in freedom cannot rest until it comes. Until the killing of black men, black mother sons, is as important as the killing of white men, white Mother, son, do you hear me now? We who believe in freedom cannot rest. We who believe in freedom cannot rest until it comes. The older I get, the better I know that the secret to my going on it's when the reins are in the hands of the young who dare to run against the storm. To me, young people come first. They have the courage where we fail. And if I can but shed some light as they carry us through the gale. Oh, we who believe in freedom cannot rest. We who believe in freedom cannot rest until it comes. I'm a woman who speaks in a voice and I tell you I must be heard. At times I can be quite difficult. I'll bow to no man's word. Struggling myself don't mean a whole lot. I've come to realize that teaching others to stand up and fight is the only way my struggle survives. I'm telling you, we who believe in freedom cannot rest. Oh, let me hear you say, we who believe in freedom cannot rest until it comes. 
We who believe in freedom cannot rest. We who believe in freedom cannot rest until it comes. It is my honor this afternoon to present the pastor of my church, Messiah Baptist Church. You want to do that first? Okay, hold off. My pastor will be coming in just a moment. <laughs> what? Okay. I'm sorry, I got so excited to introduce my pastor <laughs> that I totally skipped over a few things. I am no longer 21, and you know what happens to our memory after that. We have a recitation this afternoon entitled Standing Tall, uh, and it's written by Jamie McKenzie. And one of our young people from the Messiah Baptist Church is going to do that for us. Her name is Jasmine McQuite. She's a recent graduate of the Florida A&M University. She is, she's looking for a job. <laughs> but I'm going to ask Jasmine to come and read Standing Tall in honor of Dr. King. Good afternoon, can you all hear me? Yes. Standing Tall by Jamie McKenzie. Some kings rule their kingdom sitting down, surrounded by luxury, soft cushions, and fans. But this king stood strong, stood proud, stood tall. When the driver told Ross, move to the back of the bus. When the waiter told students, we don't serve your kind. When the mayor told voters, your vote don't count. And when the sheriff told marchers, get off our streets, the, using fire hoses, police dogs, and cattle prods to move them along, this king stood strong, stood proud, stood tall. Speaking of peace, of love, and children, hand in hand, free at last, free at last. When some deal for violence, for anger, revenge, an eye for an eye, and a tooth for a tooth, he stood his ground, preaching peace. And once some spit out hate, he stood there smiling, spreading love, until it rolled like the sea across the land, sweeping away Jim Crow, breaking down the walls, ringing the bell joyfully for freedom, until, standing at the mountaintop, they shot him coldly, hoping to see him fall, hoping to put him away, to bring him low. But this king, even in death, even today, stands proud, stands strong, stands tall, and we remember. A year ago at Messiah Baptist was the first time since Rabbi Boyd retired, that he did not participate in the letter. Um, his wife Linda was battling an illness, and he, he asked me to send his regrets last year. I just wanted to mention Linda and say how much we miss her, and I know the rabbi misses her also, but I want to acknowledge her passing today. <coughs> but I, this year I did receive a letter from Rabbi Ward, which I'd like to read to you now. The greetings from sunny Florida letter. Okay. Greetings from sunny Florida. <laughs> I am pleased to send greetings to all of you gathered here today at Messiah Baptist Church in Temple Bethamuna <laughs> to celebrate the birthday of Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. in the year 2018. In the past year, this past year has been one of tragic violence in our people and our nation. We would do well to heed the one words of Dr. King. Darkness cannot drive out darkness, only light can do that. Hate can only, cannot drive out hate, only love can do that. 
You must live together as brothers or perish together as fools. Let us pray that God will enlighten us with his presence and that through Dr. King's teachings we will find the way to true brotherhood. Rabbi H. David Warab. On October 1st, 2017, Reverend Michael Wayne Walker became our ex-pastor at the Messiah Baptist Church. He relocated to Dallas, Texas, uh, which is his home state and hometown. But he did not leave us without a qualified leader. On October 8th, 2017, we installed as our new pastor, Reverend Gerald Riggins. We are continuing a legacy at Messiah Baptist Church that is going to surpass even our last 35 years. He, like the president of this country, continues in his first 100 days. <laughs> so I have no evaluative comments to give at this time. <laughs> but I would like to call up our pastor, along with his wife, who is not here, but we will We'll, we'll put in a substitute. <laughs> but this is a legacy for the MLK observance that we don't plan to default on. And Reverend Walker has been here for the 22 years, and now the new leadership for Messiah Baptist Church picks up and continues where we are. To symbolize um, the continuance of that vision and the work that we're doing, we're going to ask Reverend Gerald Riggins if he will come and symbolically light the candle that keeps us from entering into darkness and reminds us the power of the light that can influence and touch so many. This is such a remarkable day in that he was speaking to us this morning from the book of John um, and followed up with some scriptures out of Matthew about the importance of our light shining so that others may be empowered and be, may be strengthened from that. So Reverend Regans, if you are still in our corner, <laughs> we're gonna ask you to light this candle and to give us greetings once the fire is going and only then. <laughs> Let your light so shine that others may see your work and glorify the Father. I present to you my pastor. If you have anything to say negative about him, wait till you're on the parking lot. <laughs> None other than the pastor, Gerald Riggins. Good evening, good afternoon. To our co-chairs, Brother Steve Weiner, Sister Sharon Molden, I see Rabbi Rafker in the room, to Rabbi Giles in her absence, and to all the distinguished members and friends, we welcome you today. Grace and peace from God, our Creator, through the power and the presence of the Holy Spirit be in this place. We are glad you are here to celebrate with us this Martin Luther King Jr. celebration. Well, I am diversity. Please include me. I am present every place you go. Depending on your lens, I'm friend or I'm foe. I'm a force to be reckoned with. I am not limited to age, gender, or race. I am invisible at times, and yet I'm all over the place. Learn about me. Improve my under-representation. I exclude no one. I strengthen by all, let's make the commitment going forward in the next three years to host this event in a non-faith-based location where we're not covering up the symbols from other faiths, but we recognize and be inclusive and celebrate the greatness that God has in all of us in this place. Yes, and we're deep and we're inclusive 
with all faith. Yes, let's see that greatness in all here. Yes, I am diversity. Embrace me and we will journey far. I am diversity. Include me and we will reach that shining star. Coupled with inclusion, our lights burn longer. Together we are smarter, better, and stronger. I am diversity. Yes, that's me. Again, welcome to the Martin Luther King celebration. Be with you. Peace be with you. This is an open letter to the rest of the world, especially those who are living in Haiti and Africa. First of all, I want to say how deeply sorry I am for the comments of our current president of the United States. These words were written by our rabbi, Andrea Giles, our rabbi who makes us proud to be part of Temple Beth Amuna and of this community, speaks for the leaders of all faiths who echo the words of Dr. King who once said, the ultimate tragedy is not the oppression and cruelty by the bad people, but the silence over that by the good people. Rabbi Giles refused to stand silently. At this time, I would like to ask Howard Shaw, our temple president, to represent Rabbi Giles, who is away at a chaplain's convention. Howard. Good morning. Good afternoon. <laughs> Welcome. This is new space to us. As you can tell, there's not a lot of decoration on the wall. My first decoration, and would ask uh, the member of the press uh, enterprise, I believe it is, um, if he could take a picture of us. <laughs> and we'll use that picture as the first picture to put up. <laughs> okay. As Steve mentioned, Rabbi Gauss is away at convention and has asked me to read a few words on her behalf. This past Sabbath, we read one of the middle portions of the beginning of the book, Exodus, which talks about Moses imposing, imploring Pharaoh to let the Israelite people go. Moses was seeking freedom and justice for the Israelites. He stood up to face Pharaoh, who hardened his heart and refused to hear the impassioned and fervent cries of our oppressed slaves. The black slaves, as they worked in the fields and endured physical and emotional oppression, would sing hymns based on those passages, such as, Go down, Moses, let my people go. Martin Luther King Jr., as a religious leader and a person of deep faith, referenced these passages as a foundation upon which to model the cries of the civil rights movement of the 1960s. Many of us are too familiar with oppression and prejudice. Too many of us are suffering persecution, prosecution as a result of our skin color, our economic status, and our religious beliefs. Too many of us are subject to deprivation of the spirit, soul, and body. Like Martin Luther King, we need to stand up against all injustice and all oppression. We need to stand up against all of the pharaohs of today who have hardened their hearts and tell them in no uncertain terms that all people are worthy of dignity, respect, and love. As human beings created in the image of God, we all have the right to be treated equally and be accorded the same privileges and rights as anyone else. We need to stand up to the bullies, the oppressors, the privileged few who are desperately trying to hold on to their advantage status and tell them no more. Time has come for gender equality, for race equality, for economic equality, for equal opportunity, for full equality. Only then can we carry on the work and the legacy of Martin Luther King Jr. Only then can we ensure that his work, his life, and his tragic assassination will have meaning and, were not in vain, and was not in vain. We need to build the bridges and tear down the walls between communities and as people of faith and conscience work together to ensure a better future for all of us, all of our children, and all of our children's children. May this luncheon and this program 
be the start of initiatives that will help make Martin Luther King Jr.'s dream come true, and may we realize the day when all people can stand up and freely say, free at last, free at last. Thank God Almighty, we are free at last. Thank you, and may we all experience shalom. In Hebrew, it means peace. In English, it means peace. Peace among us, peace within us, and whole spirits in the year to come. And let us say, Amen. Amen. Howie deserves a lot of credit for jumping into action Sunday night after I got the notice that the water damage at Messiah Baptist. He galvanized so many people to help put this together in such short notice. Thank you, Howie. And thank you, everybody at Temple Beth Amuna. As you know, um, we found out on Sunday afternoon about the water damage at A. Legion Parkway. We notified and invited a member of the Eastern Board of Selectmen to join us on real short notice. It is my honor today to introduce Greg Barger from the town of Easton. <laughs> Welcome. Thank you, Steve, and good afternoon, everybody. Bear with me, uh, public speaking is an art form that I'm still perfecting, so <laughs> bear with me, please. Um, I thank you for inviting me to participate in the celebration of Dr. King's birthday, his life's work, and his legacy. Monday would have been Dr. King's 89th birthday. When I think about Dr. King, I wish that he were still alive today to help, us, to help lead us once again because the struggle for human rights and civil rights in this country is still ongoing and far from over. I reread the famous, powerful, and compelling I Have a Dream speech from 1963, and I submit to you that many of Dr. King's dreams are yet to be fulfilled. And if he were alive today, I think he might modify one of my favorite paragraphs from the original 1963 speech. When we allow freedom to ring, when we let it ring from every city and every hamlet, from every state and every city, we will be able to speed up that day when all God's children, black men and women, white men and women, Jews, Gentiles, Protestants, Muslims, and Catholics will be able to join hands and sing in the words of the old Negro spiritual, free at last, free at last, great God Almighty, we are free at last. Given the recent events in places like Charlottesville, Virginia, and the divisive, hateful, and racist rhetoric emanating from the highest levels of government, and the significant rise in anti-Semitic incidents, I urge vigilance and peaceful resistance to these voices of evil. And I paraphrase from another portion of Dr. King's speech. I say to you today, my friends, even though we face the difficulties of today and tomorrow, I still have a dream. It is a dream deeply rooted in the American dream. I have a dream that one day this nation will rise up again, live out the true meaning of its creed. We hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men and women are created equal. Thank you. This morning I got a call of regrets from the mayor's office. Um, Mr. Carpenter got a, uh, got the flu again, he got a relapse. Um, we do have a city council at large here today, so I'm gonna invite Jean Delancourt to come up and say a few words on behalf of the city. Surprise. <laughs> Surprise. <laughs> to put me on the spot, right? Yes. <laughs> well, let's face it. Um, good evening. Uh, like I said, I did not even know that I was going to talk, but when they put you on the podium, you have to follow through, I think. Uh, Dr. King would expect that from any of us. 
to be ready and determined to speak at any given moment. So um, I would like to thank you uh, for taking the time to be here this morning. But um, as a man of God, and of course, be here at the temple, uh, I would like to quote the Bible. Um, in Matthew 7, verse 7, the Bible said, Ask, uh, it shall be given to you. And seek, you shall find, and knock, the door shall be open. I think this moment, more than ever, we are asking for justice. We are asking for justice because in the face of what we already know, the Trump administration have shown no respect for any of us. Mm. I don't care whether you are Republican or Democrat, but so far, and you know it, no respect for us. And I am very hurt by the president's recent statement as a Haitian American man and the first Haitian American male elected in Massachusetts, the president just killed me. When he called Haiti, I will not repeat the word that you already know. It's a shameful. As the first black nation independent in this world, I would assume the president would have known what it meant to actually have a history like that. We define democracy, not just in our country, but even in this country. If you recall in, in 1779, we fought for this country. Mm -hmm. In 1943, Haiti gave this country $1 million in World War II. Most people don't know that history, but I do. You know why? Because I opened the history book and I did the research. And I would encourage the president or his people to do some research here. You know why? Because <laughs> so, have been sad. I think you probably know because as a 27 years old, it's painful. It's painful to actually see what's going on. And I said it to too many people. You know what? I've been in this country for seven years. And I've seen the greatness of this country. I believe Trump does not represent this country. I believe Trump represents himself and a few <laughs> folks who believe in him. Amen. You know why? Because I know some of you personally, and I've seen what you've done. So for me to witness some of those things, it is painful. And I would like to acknowledge the greatness of each and every single one of you. Please don't give up on what's going on. It is not a joke, whether it is in this country or Haiti. Dr. King said, and justice anywhere is a threat to justice everywhere. Yes, sir. We are caught by a gamut of destiny, mutual aggression. So we have a solemn obligation, not just to look good, but to speak loud and expect nothing more than fairness and justice. And I said it to anybody who know me. I came in this country, I learned the language because I want to assimilate, to follow through. I chose to become a US citizen because I want to get involved. Not to take advantage, but to give back. And I went to school to get an education. You know why? Because of you. You opened the door to all of us. And we should never forget, this is a nation of immigrants. This is our country. This is our city. And this is our town, because we are in Islam. So no matter where you come from or what you believe in, you have an obligation to stand up for justice. You have an obligation to stand up for what is good. I know to my core that you believe in justice. But you know what? In the face of desperation, there can be hope. You are the hope. You are an inspiration to me, because you know why? You've been there and done it. At my age, we need you folks to talk to us, to encourage us, because you know what? We will shape the next generation, regardless you like it or not. We will stand up for what we believe, and we will do it with dignity. Because as a Haitian American, witness the president speaking like that, the president has no respect for anybody, because he believes he can do it. In this moment, in the spirit of Dr. King, we should not look down, folks. We should look straight. And I said it to people. My father taught me a few words. My words is my reputation. When I say yes, I mean it. And when I say no, I mean it. And when I shake your hands, I will follow you. And I've been fortunate in this country to have folks like Senator Brady who opened the door for me, like Mark Lendy that I serve at the library, and Len Smith. Those people inspire me to do better and go further. So my frustration is not on you, but my frustration is what the president is saying. Because the president got to understand that Haiti opened the door for so many countries. 
We should never forget 1803 when Haiti fought to get her independence. And you know what's so funny? We did not just stay there. We go around the world to fight for other nations. That's why so many nations understand the complexity of history. History is not a piece of cake, folks. People die for it. You know what's funny? When we have only slave in Haiti, everybody was free. We should never forget that this country took more than 200 years to abolish slavery. When the president said, let makes this country great again, I've seen some people smile. Do we want to go back to slavery? Do we want to teach our children that lesson? This morning, I challenge you not just to talk about the greatness of Dr. King or to embrace his speeches, but to act with respect and dignity. And I like the pastor or the reverend who ask everybody to hold hands and feel the greatness of the person that you are holding hands. Because you know why? We are all martyrs. We are all children of God. I don't care whether you are Jews or Catholic or whatever. We are children of God. You can call it whatever you want. That's why I chose to quote the Bible. At my age, I ask you for your blessings and your wisdom. Please bear with me. You know why? Because it's not easy out there. And I said it all the time. If I say something or behave a certain way you don't like, let me know. Don't keep it to yourself. And if I have to change it, I will change it. But if, if it is for justice, trust me on that one. I would rather lose my life than to back down for nonsense. We don't follow nonsense. I was born in Haiti, but I am a citizen of the world. I will be able, and you will be able to survive anywhere there is people, whether you speak the language or not. Please be brave and be bold. May God bless you, and may God bless our great nation of America. Thank you, folks. It is my pleasure to introduce the current president of the Brockton NAACP. <coughs> she is none other than Phyllis Ellis. She has been a member for years and has been actively engaged in the mission of the NAACP branch. She has chaired numerous committees and is currently chair of the AXO committee and the MLK committee for Brockton. <coughs> She is responsible for the implementation of the branch's website and its monthly newsletter. Phyllis is committed to advancing the mission of the Brockton area NAACP, and that mission is to ensure the political, educational, social, and economic equality of rights of all persons and to eliminate race-based discrimination, and I might add, and gender-based <laughs> discrimination. On a personal note, we add that Phyllis was born in Winston-Salem, North Carolina. All right. All right. <laughs> she is a graduate of the North Carolina Central University, and she moved to Boston many years ago, and we'll do a quiz on how many years at some point <laughs> later. <laughs> She is the proud parent of three children and six grandchildren. Today, Phyllis will be offering greetings from the Brockton area NAACP and also honoring us and Dr. King by reciting a, a poem from Maya Angelou entitled, Still I Rise. Please receive Phyllis Ellis. Thank you, Sharon. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. On behalf of the Brockton Area Branch National Association for the Advancement of Colored People, I would like to thank Steve Weiner, Sharon Mulder, Messiah Baptist Church, and the Temple of Bethany Muna for inviting us here to celebrate their 22nd annual celebration of the Dr. Martin Luther King. The Brockton Area Branch was chartered in 1957 we will celebrate our 65th anniversary next year. And our mission is equality for all people. Now, as we reflect on Dr. King this week, 
I have to reflect on one of his dreams. And even though it's already stated this, day, <laughs> this morning, I bears repeating. In 1963, Dr. King had a dream. He had a dream that one day this nation would rise up and realize the true meaning of his creed, that all men are created equal. And even though the people in Washington have not got that message, we, the people, African Americans, Haitians, Latinos, Jewish, we will rise up to any occasion and we will prevail. I was asked today to perform, recite a poem by Maya Angelou, and I think it's fitting in today's climate. It's a poem about respect and confidence, and the poem is entitled, Still I Rise, by Maya Angelou. You may write me down in history with your bitter, twisted lies. You may trod me in the very dirt, but still, like dust, I rise. Does my sassiness upset you? Why are you beset with gloom? Because I walk like I got oil wells pumping in my living room? Just like moons and like suns with the certainty of tides, just like hope springing high, still, I rise. Did you want to see me broken with bowed head and lowered eyes, shoulders falling down like teardrops, weakened by my sofa cries? Does my haughtiness offend you? Don't you take it off for hard, cause I laugh <laughs> like I got gold mines digging in my own backyard. <laughs> you may shoot me with your words. You may cut me with your eyes. You may kill me with your hatefulness, but still, like air, I rise. Does my sexiness offend you? Does it come as a surprise that I dance like I got diamonds at the meeting of my thighs? Out of the huts of history's shame, I rise. Up from a past that's rooted in pain, I rise. I am a black ocean, leaping and wide, welling and swelling, I bear in the tide. Leaving behind nights of terror and fear, I rise into a daybreak that's wondrously clear. I rise, bringing the gifts that my ancestors gave. I am the hope and the dream of the slave. I rise, I rise, I rise. Still I rise. Thank you, fellas. <laughs> Earlier this afternoon, an old friend was here. Um, you all probably know him, Ozzy Jordan. Yeah. He um, got a call that his brother was taken to the hospital, so he had to leave. But in his honor, I'm going to do something that he has always done at this program. May I ask all the children to please rise and be recognized? All the children to please rise and be recognized? <laughs> all of you. <laughs> I see my granddaughter, but I don't see anybody else. More kids? Thank you. Um, I also like to recognize one person, um, and I usually don't recognize people in the audience, but we have joined us today a former keynote speaker, Shana Barnes. And I'd just like to recognize you today. Um, at this time, we're going to take a little musical interlude. I'd like to introduce David Rothberg from Temple High School in Easton, along with his, the choir, are going to entertain us with some music. David?
What an honor it is to be here today. Thank you for bearing with our logistical uh, uh, doings. Um, good afternoon. It's been so inspiring hearing everyone speak and all the wonderful poetry today. Um, I guess we'll, we'll add a little bit more. Um, you have in your booklets some words to the songs because Please do not view these as performances. These are songs that we want you to sing with us. Um, and there are some parts that you will you'll, you'll make or break this for us. Um, so the first song is called My Feet Are Praying. This is a song that reflects one of the things that makes me most proud to be a Jew in 2018, which is um, Rabbi Abraham Joshua Heschel marching with Martin Luther King and Ralph Bunch um, in Selma. And famously, um, the, the march took place on a Saturday, and it was Shabbat. And um, Rabbi Heschel was asked, so um, it must have been quite, a, quite an eventful day. Did you have a chance to say your prayers? And so he famously said, I felt as though my feet were doing the praying for me. And that is such an inspirational quotation. Um, I was moved to write a song based on that called My Feet Are Praying. So um, please, please join us in singing this. He said my feet are praying, my feet are praying, marching on in our through Selma with Martin Luther King. Abraham Joshua Heschel was his name, my feet are praying. He knew that segregation was the nation's shame, my feet are praying. Montgomery was hidden in stride by me. I prayed. And Martin said, Walk with me on the front line. He said, My feet are praying. My feet are praying. Marching on and on through Selma with Martin Luther King. Martin King called Heschel, my rabbi. My feet are praying. The Heschel called King a prophet from on high. My feet are praying. He wrote that the prophets brought justice to town. My feet are praying. He was a mystical rabbi with his feet on the ground. He said, my feet are praying. My feet are praying, marching on and on through Selma with Martin Luther King. Now's the time that we bring this song into the present because it's not enough to be proud of our history. It's not enough to be thinking of the great things in the past. We need to take things into the present and into the future, and so we'll continue with our feet are praying as a community. King and Heschel knew the work wasn't done. Our feet are praying. So now it's up to us to fight for freedom. Our feet are praying. They knew that we have to do more than just talk. Our feet are praying to heal our world we have to walk the walk and now our feet are praying our feet are praying marching arm in arm through Selma with Martin Luther King marching arm in arm through Selma with Martin
you. And we'd like to do another song now um, that is about the fact that sometimes this fight is difficult. Sometimes things don't look good. And we need to have hope that things are going to get better, even though, though we might not be able to see how they're going to get better. We need to know that you know, if all we see is darkness, there is a light at the end of the tunnel. And if we can't see the light yet, maybe we need to be that light ourselves. So please, um, please sing with this. There's a little um, very easy uh, part for you to do. When I sing, there's a light, there's a light. Ah, let's try that. Let's try that and go into the chorus. Let me hear all of you do that. There's a light. There's a light at the end of the tunnel. I know it, but I can't see it yet. And if we lend a hand to one another, we'll shine that light. When it feels like the world has turned against you And you're groping around in the dark And every day brings a whole new world of trouble That's the very time to make your mark there's a light there's a light at the end of the tunnel I know it but I can't see it yet and if we lend a hand to one another we'll shine that light up can't even think of where to start and it seems like salvation is so far far away let me help you to remember just a single step and you're on your there's a light, there's a light at the end of the tunnel. I know it, but I can't see it yet. And if we lend a hand to one another, we'll shine that light ourselves. Sing it with me now. There's a light, there's a light at the end of the tunnel. I know it, but I can't see it yet. And if we let a hand to one another, we'll shine that light. We'll shine the light ourselves. We'll shine. We'll shine the light ourselves.
Thank you, David. And thank you, choir. In 1959, at a conference in Chicago on religion and civil rights, Rabbi Abraham Joshua Heschel gave an impassioned speech, an impassionate call to arms to clergy of all faiths that it was their obligation to join the civil rights movement. Dr. King had not yet arrived in Chicago till after Heschel's speech. When Dr. King was informed about this rabbi, he sought him out and they became friends. As David so beautifully wrote, Rabbi Heschel became part of the movement. On the evening of September 25th, 1968, 10 days before he was killed, Dr. Martin Luther King appeared at the 68th Annual Convention of the Rabbinical Assembly. <coughs> Here is a transcript of what was of that evening, beginning with the words of Professor Abraham Joshua Heschel, who presented Dr. Martin Luther King to the several rabbis. Our Brotherhood President, Ed Barron, as Rabbi Herschel, will now introduce Keith Jackson as Martin Luther King in a reenactment re of that 1968 rabbinical assembly. Where does moral religious leadership in America come from today? The politicians are astute, the establishment is proud, and the marketplace is busy. Placid, happy, merry, the people pursue their work, enjoy their leisure, and life is fair. People buy, sell, celebrate, and rejoice. They fail to realize that in the midst of our affluent cities, there are districts of despair, areas of distress. Where does God dwell in America today? He's at home with those who are complacent, indifferent to other people's agony, devoid of mercy. Is he not rather with the poor and the contrite and the slums? Dark is the world for me, for all its cities and stars. If not for the few signs of God's radiance, who could stand such agony, such darkness? Where in America today do we hear a voice like the voice of the prophets of Israel? Martin Luther King is a sign that God has not forsaken the United States of America. God has sent him to us. His presence is the hope of America. His mission is sacred. His leadership of supreme importance to every one of us. The situation of the poor in America is our plight, our sickness. To be deaf to their cry is to condemn ourselves. Martin Luther King is a, vi is a voice, a vision, and a way. I call upon every Jew to hearken to his voice, to share his vision, to follow in his way. The whole future of America will depend upon the impact and the influence of Dr. King. May everyone present give of his strength to this great spiritual leader Dr. Martin Luther King. I need not pause to say how very delighted I am to be here this evening and to have the opportunity to share with you in this significant meeting. But I do want to express my deep personal appreciation to each of you for extending the invitation. It is always a very rich and a rewarding experience when I can take time, take a brief break from the day-to-day -day demands of our struggle for freedom and human dignity, and discuss the issues involved in that struggle with concerned friends of goodwill all over our nation. And so I deem this a real and a great opportunity. Another thing that I would like to mention is that I have heard we shall overcome. Probably more than I have heard any other song over the last few years. It is something of the theme song of our struggle. But tonight, 
was the first time that I ever heard we shall overcome in Hebrew. <laughs> so that too was a beautiful experience for me to hear that great song in Hebrew. It is also a wonderful experience to be here on the occasion of the 60th birthday of a man that I consider one of the truly great men of our day and age, Rabbi Heschel. He is indeed a truly great prophet. I've looked over the last few years being involved in the struggle for racial justice. And all too often I have seen religious leaders stand amid the social injustices that pervade our society, mounting pious irrelevancies and sanctimonious trivialities. All too often the religious community has been a tail light instead of a headlight. But here and there we find those who refuse to remain silent behind the safe security of stained glass windows. And they are forever seeking to make the great ethical insights of our Judeo-Christian heritage relevant in this day and in this age. I feel that Rabbi Heschel is one of the persons who is relevant at all times, always standing with prophetic insights to guide us through these difficult days. He has been with us in many of our struggles. I remember marching from Selma to Montgomery, how he stood at my side and with us as we faced that crisis situation. I remember very well when we were in Chicago for the conference on religion and race. Eloquently and profoundly, he spoke of the issues of race and religion, and to a great extent, his speech inspired clergymen of all the religious faiths of our country. Many went out and decided to do something that they had not done before. So I'm happy to be with him, and I want to say happy birthday. And I hope that I can be here to celebrate your 100th birthday. I'm not going to make a speech. We must get right to your questions. I simply want to say that we do confront a crisis in our nation, a crisis born of many problems. We see on every hand the restlessness of the comfortable and the discontent of the affluent. And somehow it seems that this mammoth ship of state is not moving toward new and more secure shores, but toward old and destructive rocks. It seems to me that all people of goodwill must now take a stand for that which is just, that which is righteous. Indeed, in the words of the prophet Amos, let justice roll down like waters and righteousness like a mighty stream. Our priorities are mixed up. Our national purposes are confused. Our policies are confused. Our purposes confused. And there must somehow be a reordering of our priorities, a reordering of our policies and purposes. And I hope as we discuss these issues tonight that together, we will be able to find some guidelines and some sense of direction. Thank you, Ed, and thank you, Keith. Dr. King then took questions from the rabbis. After the convention, Dr. King rejoined the organization of organizing the sanitation workers in Memphis. His words motivated the rabbis who were ready to join him in December for the 1968 Peace March in Washington. We all know what happened in April of 1968 in Memphis, but the movement continued. 
One rabbi who was there in 1968 was H. David Werb. He came to Brockton in 1971 with the same grit as Rabbi Heschel and Dr. King. Through the 80s and 90s, he led us to greater interfaith, interracial, and diversity in Brockton, culminating with the formation of BIC, with Temple Beth Amuna being founders and charter members, along with Messiah Baptist Church and other churches. It is my privilege to introduce our keynote speaker and to give you a little background information on the Brockton Interfaith Community. The Brockton Interfaith Community was founded in 1990. You can do the math. And it was developed by the area clergy um, that was included um, in terms of the pressing needs and concerns in the city of Brockton. BIC has since expanded um, and grown into a powerful regional organization with 13 religious institutions, the Cape Verdean Association of Brockton, and Stonehill College. It is BIC's goal to improve the lives of those in Brockton through building the leadership capacity of ordinary citizens. Our speaker this afternoon currently is at the helm of the Brockton Interfaith Community. He is Elder William H. Dickerson II, who has just welcomed William <laughs> Dickerson III, <laughs> not to be confused. As the executive director of the Brockton Interfaith Community, we recognize it as a faith-based community organization, which is a nonprofit. He is a Colorado native. We forgive him for that. <laughs> he is a pastor and has been doing community organizing for five and a half years. He has been welcomed to the Brockton family as of April of 2017 in this leadership capacity. His expertise is in racial equity and leadership development. And over the past five years, as a community organizer, he has spearheaded many activities that impact change within faith, within the faith and oppressed communities. His work is deeply rooted in his faith in God and his love for his community. His main focus is that of the vision of BIC, to develop ordinary people in communities to become prophetic faith leaders that develop power to strengthen communities, to develop relationships with public officials, and ultimately to develop other community members to become leaders as well. We welcome to the podium our keynote speaker, who I'm sure has a prophetic word for us and will inspire us to levels that even we didn't know we had the capacity to assume. I ask you to join me in receiving Reverend William H. Dickerson II. So funny to hear those uh, those those uh, remarks um, about yourself. Um, <laughs> it's uh, funny and weird at the same time. Um, before I get started, I uh, before I ever speak for anyone in any kind of way, I always um, like to share a song, um, and that's because my first love and my first ministry is actually music. Um, God just keeps pushing me into other <laughs> spaces as time goes on. Let your presence fill this house. Let your presence fill this house. Let 
at your fragrance and the sweet smelling savor. Fill this temple, remove all pain and doubt so your presence can fill this house. And let your power fill this house. Let your power fill this house. Let your fragrance and the sweet smelling savor fill our temples, remove all hurt and doubt. So your power can feel this house and let your love feel this house let your love feel this house let your fragrance and the sweet smelling savor fill our temples remove despair and doubt so your presence your glory your power and love can fill this house god i ask that you will make my hands and feet your hands and feet my eyes and ears, your eyes and ears. My mouth and tongue, your mouth and tongue. Make my mind like your mind and my heart like your heart. And fill me from head to toe with your spirit. Amen. Amen. <laughs> All right, now that we got that out of the way. <laughs> how are y'all feeling? How are you doing today? You all right? Good. So as y'all heard, I'm a pastor. And I'm a black pastor at that. Amen. So y'all see, see me. Right? <laughs> and I heard somebody say amen, and, and you're setting the tempo All right, of what I want to feel from you. Because right. if I'm going to talk, I'm not going to talk at you. We're going to talk together. Come on. Come on. It's interesting because last night I was up all night trying to write something, trying to prepare. And God has taught me over and over and over again that he will not let me prepare for what I'm supposed to say. I wanted to come in here and share a little bit with you about who I am. I will do that. But first, I wanted to think with you and talk with you about a scripture that has come to my mind. A story, if you will. You know, as I'm listening to folks, as you all are getting up and speaking, as I'm experiencing the world, as I'm hearing the rhetoric of some folks, some individuals, and how they view our countries and our people, as I see the response to those remarks and the ways in which people are engaging with each other in conversation, I feel and sense the amount of despair and anger and anguish that people across this country and ultimately across this world are feeling. And what's interesting to me is that in those times, what can often happen to us is when we start to feel paralyzed. As if we can't move, as if as if we can't do anything about what's going on, and oftentimes we want to give up. When you can't see light at the end of a tunnel, oftentimes you start to believe that maybe you're in a cave. And so the story that I'm going to share, I'm hoping is going to illuminate a little bit about where we're going and what I believe God has for us. The story comes out of the book of Daniel. And it's about, in my tradition, the way we talk about these three young men is we call them the three Hebrew boys. 
Some of y'all may be familiar with the story. But I think that this story is deeply powerful and speaks a little bit about what we're facing and what our calling is in this moment. You see, in the story, the three Hebrew boys have found themselves in a little bit of a predicament. The king at that time, King Nebuchadnezzar, has stepped outside of himself and has allowed people to believe that he is a god. And not only has he allowed people to believe this, not only has he started to believe it himself, but he creates an image of gold for himself. I find it interesting how always at some point empire wants to create an image for people to bow down to. In the story, Nebuchadnezzar comes up with this crazy idea that not only is he going to build this image, not only does he believe he's a god, not only does he want others to believe that he's a god, but he wants them to make sure that they bow down to this image. That they make a big spectacle about bowing down to this image. But the three Hebrew boys make a pact together. A pact that says that they're going to serve the living God. And that they're not going to bow down to this idol. Now if you're listening, which I'm hoping you are, I'm going somewhere with this. All right. Takes it up. <laughs> In the story, after they make this pact, now they have to live into the pact. You see, empire isn't going to back down. They're going to proceed with what they've created. And so they play the music, they cue the drums, and they expect all of the people to bow down to the image. And I like to talk about this as one of the first times we see a sit-in, yet a stand-in. The three Hebrew boys are standing while all, everyone else is bowing down. Now, the agitation that I feel in this moment is, is they weren't the only people that came from Israel. The agitation that I feel is that they weren't the only folks that understood that bowing down to this idol was against their beliefs and their teachings. They weren't the only ones that had been taught. But the story says that they were the only ones that stood. The story goes on. The king Nebuchadnezzar had made a decree that if folks weren't bowing down, that there was going to be a consequence for that, that they were going to be thrown into the fiery furnace. Stop me if I'm not telling this story, will you? <laughs> and so they get to this point where some folks come to King Nebuchadnezzar, and they tell him, there's these three Hebrew boys, those ones that you appointed to be leaders in your kingdom. They aren't bowing down. You always got a tattletale, right? <laughs> they can't wait to get you into trouble. Ouch. <laughs> <laughs> and so they pull them in, and King Nebuchadnezzar has a conversation with them. And in the conversation, he's like, I want to work this out with y'all. See, empire first wants to love you before they beat you. <laughs> they want to see if they can get you to where they want you to be without having to make a public spectacle. They want to see if they can soften you down. If you will give in to any parts of your morals or your values. If you haven't experienced it, you aren't fighting yet. So they get in and he's trying to soften them up. And this is my favorite part of the story. 
these three Hebrew boys look at the king and they say, oh, king, our God has the power to save us. But even if he doesn't, we're still not going to bow down to your idol. <laughs> even if he doesn't. Y'all ain't hearing me. Yeah, we do. <laughs> I want to propose something to you all today. I believe that right now we are living in an even if moment. The odds are stacked up against us. The world is looking worse every day. Racism, hatred, bigotry is on the rise. And we even have a president right now who represents empire, who is upholding the statutes of the idol of racism, even as we speak. And what I will tell you is that I believe that even now, empire is trying to get us to bow down to something. The question is, what are they calling you to bow down to? I'm not going to spell that out for you because it's different for every person. But there are ways in which empire is asking you to give in to your morals and give in to your values and follow after it. <coughs> And that if you do so, you'll feel comfortable. You can hide for a little while. But you aren't living into your calling. I say again, we are living in an even if moment. That something has to stir inside us in a different kind of way than ever before. That we can no longer go along in this world as business as usual. But that we're called to stand up. You have a decision to make. The end of the story is, it brings me to tears almost every time I tell it. I'm going to try and do it without crying. And I'm not really a cry. <laughs> the end of the story is what's powerful because the three Hebrew boys didn't know what was going to happen. And they actually didn't care. They knew what was right and they knew what was wrong and they were going to step into right. And so, empire, <coughs> King Nebuchadnezzar is furious. And I'm thinking that I understand him to be the kind of person that's like, you're not going to embarrass me in front of all of these people. <laughs> right? The black folks in the room might know what I'm talking about. You may have some parents. <laughs> <laughs> and you know, if your parents tell you, you ain't going to embarrass me. <laughs> but that whooping is coming, right? So he says, not only am I going to make a, 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 a spectacle out of you, not only am I going to draw attention to this now, I'm going to heat this fire up hotter than it's ever been, but seven times hotter. Mm -hmm. That's the word. It says that it was so hot that, that when the, the people that were throwing them into the furnace threw them in, it killed them. Yeah, <laughs> I'm just telling you all the story. It talks about the clothing that they were wearing. I, just, I want to share with y'all this. It talks about the clothing. If you read what the, the three Hebrew boys were wearing, it was the most flammable kinds of clothing that you could ever think about. Mm. And I find it interesting that the author in this moment is sharing this because I believe he's trying to get us to understand the power of God. Yeah. <coughs> Everything about them was flammable in a furnace that was seven times hotter than it was supposed to be. And when they get thrown into the furnace, they stand up. And they look around. 
and they realize they're not burning up. Mm. But on, not only that, they sense a presence around them. Yeah. <coughs> and that presence is standing there with them, reminding them that they were never alone to begin with. Right. A presence that stood in the fire while they were in the fire. Nebuchadnezzar looks inside and he realizes these brothers are not burning up. He saw his, his guards fall dead. They're not dying. And not only that, he says, I can see someone else in there. Huh. We threw three people in there, four people inside. Amen. And they pulled him out. And that day, Nebuchadnezzar, King Nebuchadnezzar, shifts his old thinking about how he was going to run his country. Did y'all hear that? Yes. I not only believe that we are living in an even if moment, y'all, but I believe that there are very few groups of people that can stand in the tension like people of faith. I'll say that again. We're living in an even if moment and that not many people can stand in the tension like people of faith can. There is something about what we believe and how we experience the world that makes us perfect candidates to lead this fight. When the rest of the world is angry and wavering and can't understand where to look to or how to move, People of faith have a particular story that they ought to be sharing. We have a particular resolve on how we show up in the world, and it's because we've come this far by, in my tradition, faith. But we can use the word God. I ask you the question again. Are you willing to stand in the fire with a mentality that is even if. I'm going to close with this. I'm sure y'all want to know who I am and all these kinds of things. I'm sorry. I'm sharing what I'm sharing because this is what God has put on my heart. There is a particular narrative and story that is being shared a story that gets shared in <coughs> the media, a story that is getting shared across the country, a story that gets shared every day in the city of Brockton. And the story is settled in this idea that there are people out there that are more important than others. Mm. Mercy. And that story hits me very deeply because I fall into the category of people that are not important. <coughs> now, we got to sit in this tension, y'all. If we're going to do something about this, we got to sit in it. You see, some of my earliest memories, some of my earliest understandings about my skin mm -hmm. and who I am were steeped in pain and steeped in the understanding that because of the color of my skin, I was the problem. Can you hear it? Can you sit in it? Because if we're going to fight together, I need you to be able to sit in this with me. And I just had a little baby boy. We call him Little Trace. <laughs> and he's beautiful. Like so many babies are, right? Some babies, not all babies, but some babies. <laughs> I had to say it, I'm just playing, y'all. All babies are beautiful. All babies are beautiful. To somebody, somebody believes all babies. This baby is beautiful to me. And when he first came out, is, I, I don't know if you've ever seen, like when black babies are born, they come out real light. That's right. And each day I'm watching as his skin is starting to darken. And I'm telling him every day how beautiful his skin is. Mm -hmm. And 
I know that in the world that we have right now, he's going to get to an age, and it's young, y'all. We're talking five and six. He's going to come to an age where people start to see him as the problem. And I'm telling you right now, I am not going to stand for that. Amen. That's where I draw the line. If this country wants a fight, they pick it. Because you don't get to mess with my family. And so that story has to change. And what I'm trying to get us to understand is, is that it is us that has to tell the new story. That not only do we have to have an even if mentality, but we have to have a vision of a different community. That we have to have an understanding that the communities and the ways in which they're working now is not working for everybody. And quite frankly, it's not working for any of us. The question is, are you going to go home, turn on your television, and try to forget about this conversation? Or are you going to shift your thinking and try to figure out a way to tell a new story? Are you willing to give yourself for this yet? And if not, what is it going to take? Because I believe that this president and this administration has said it all. And my mother told me, if a person tells you believe something, them. believe them. <laughs> are we going to wait till they act on it? Or are we going to believe them and organize and do something about it? Impeach, impeach, impeach. <laughs> But y'all get to talk about how you want to do it. <laughs> but what I want to say is, is that I'm here to tell a new story. I'm here to tell a new story about my little boy. I'm here to tell a new story about myself. I'm here to tell a new story about Brockton. I'm here to tell a new story about Massachusetts and what it is and what it can become. But not only am I here to tell a new story, I'm here to act on making that story a reality. Thank you so much for having me. For this Let's hear it one more time for Will. At this time, I'm going to ask David to come back up here and be joined by Sharon and all the clergy members here for our final song, which will be followed by a closing prayer by Rabbi Kafka, Randy Kafka from Temple Cole Tickford and Sharon. Could all the clergy please come up and join Sharon and David? As we heard uh, Martin Luther King so beautifully channeled that uh, he had never heard it in Hebrew before. If you haven't, now's your big chance. <laughs> we shall Shall overcome. 
Shalom bim ramav, huya sa shalom alenu, v'al kol yoshevei tevel. May the one who makes peace in the highest and the deepest parts of us bring peace upon us and upon all who dwell on the earth. Amen. Amen.